Okay, in the Stone Chumash, we're on page 30. <coughs> Last time we began uh, the first few psukim of Parshas Noyach. Basically, it says, Noyach was a righteous person in his generation. Different opinions say that's good. Different opinions say it's bad. Certain people say it's good because even in his generation, where everybody was bad, he was good. And the other people say, no, just the opposite. He was only considered good in his generation. But if he would have been in a generation like uh, Avram Avinu, which was a better generation, he wouldn't have been anybody. There's two ways of looking at it. Okay, and Neach also gave birth to three sons. And by the way, the Ramban says, interestingly, all the other people we learned before had sons and daughters. Remember it mentioned the, the son that carried on and then... It said they gave birth to sons and daughters. Noyach only had three boys, no girls. Shem, Chum, and Yafes. According to most opinions, Yafes, the last one mentioned, was the oldest. Then some people say Chum and Shem. Why is Shem mentioned first? Because he was the greatest and uh, the Jews come from him. Avram Avinu came from him. But um, that was the, the discussion about that. Okay. So, Pasik, we're going to start the third line. It's where we're up to. But the Shachit Sa'adis of Neolikim, the earth became corrupt before God. Um, the earth became full of robbery. Okay, that's what I mean. The world became corrupt, the earth became full of robbery. Now, what does it mean? that the earth became corrupt before God. It should say the world became corrupt. Why is it emphasizing before God it became corrupt? So there's a lot of different opinions. Some people say that they sinned in a way that only God knew about it. <laughs> that means they didn't sin publicly that everybody in the world knew they were bad. Only God knew they were bad. Um... Other people say, no, that the, the Zohar says, they sinned um, initially, they were only bad before God, and then they became bad before everybody. Okay? Others hold that Lakim doesn't even mean God. But the Shachi Sa'adis from Lakim, some people say, the leaders of the generation, they didn't even care about sinning in the presence of the leaders of the generation. That means there was no respect, like nowadays, there was no respect for authority. Authority didn't mean anything. They weren't embarrassed of anybody. Basically, the world was pretty bad. So whichever way it was, whether it is the world was corrupt only in the presence of God, uh, or that they did it even in public, you know, openly, and uh, everybody knew they sinned, or... It was only uh, they continued sinning uh, on a regular basis. Now, what hap- What does the Pasuk say? Well, the earth became full of robbery. Even though, before we learned, they did idolatry, adultery, murder. They did all the sins in the book. What sin <coughs> caused Hashem to destroy them with the flood? The sin of robbery. Meaning, and we find later on in the same passion, at the end of the portion, it, <coughs> it speaks about what's called the Dor HaFlogger. Dor HaFlogger means the generation that built the tower, they wanted to go fight God. You know, it took them a year to walk up, it took them a year to walk down. That's how big the tower was. We'll learn more details when we get there. Their whole intention was to fight God. But over there, the Pasik introduces it by with the Pasik that they were united. They went to fight God in idolatry, but they were united in what they did. The people were together. And this is remarkable. God said, I don't care if you come to fight me. As long as you're together in it, that's fine. Therefore, the Dorha flog of that generation, God didn't destroy. He just spread them out over 70 languages that nobody should know what the other one was talking about. But he didn't destroy them. 
Why didn't he do you late? Why didn't he destroy them? Because they were united. Here, the sin of the Mabel, the main sin, even though, again, they did idolatry, adultery, we're going to learn. The animals were corrupt. The animals were mating with animals not of their own. The earth was corrupt. Everything was corrupt. What was the final, so to speak, in Hebrew it's called Makkah Papatish, the final blow that caused Hashem to destroy them? Robbery. Meaning, between man to man, they were awful. And God said, that already I will not tolerate. You want to fight, go against God, spiritual thing, as long as you're united, okay, it's wrong, but I can handle it. When you're, I'll give you an example even today. I'm not saying you should do it, and uh, there's even uh, kids in high school here. Sometimes a kid does a prank in school, and the teacher doesn't know who did it. And he wants the kids to snitch. And if not, he punishes, you know know what goes on, right? They punish everybody, the teacher punishes everybody, and says, okay, you have to tell me. So you have two types of classes. You have a class that's united, and no matter what, they will never tell the teacher. (laughs) Even though they're all going to get into trouble, they will not tell. Then you have a class (coughs) of goody-goodies. You know, they want to... So they'll tell the principal or the teacher who did it. You you find this today in human nature. I'm not justifying it, but the reality is the kids that stick together, not to snitch, that's a much better class. I know the teacher is going to be angry, but down deep, down deep the teacher says, those God, that they're, they're good. They stick together no matter what. They're united. That's really the way it should be. <coughs> Not the snitch. You know, there's an interesting halach in Shulchan Aruch. It's from the Gemara, but it's a law in Shulchan Aruch. If enemies of the Jews come to a city <coughs> and they say, Give us so and so to kill, or else we'll kill you all. Either give out, or this, God forbid, this woman to rape, or else we'll do, kill you all. Torah says, You're not allowed to give out that person. You're not allowed to give out that person. You cannot actively do something to get somebody killed. Everybody's going to get killed, they'll get killed. But you can't actively do it. And that's the sin over here of the generation of the flood was primarily the Choma says, as Rashi says, robbery. And Rashi says, the bottom line of it is um, here, a gezel. And Rashi says, uh, bottom line is, l'nechtem gzardinam el ala gezel. Rashi quotes in the Gemara in Sanhedrin that the sealing of the decree to wipe out this generation was because they stole now, in Hebrew, they stole from, each other. from each other. They didn't steal from themselves. No, no, I mean, what, what from? Okay, I'll tell you, there's two things, though. <coughs> the Torah uses the word chamas, which Rashi translates to mean stealing, gezel. But halachically, there's a difference. In Gemara, you have a gazelin, Torah, you have a gazelin, a guy that steals. Chamsen, a chamas, is really a different thing. I don't really steal it. You have something I want. You don't want to sell it to me. I give you the money, but I forcibly take it from you. So it's not really stealing. Stealing is I take it for free. Here, by the way, it's also halachically called stealing. And that's what happened in Chamas. The Mepharshim explained the definition. The Gemara explained. The definition of the word Chamas means I want it, I take it, but I'm going to pay for it. But you don't want to sell it to me. That's really what the word chamas means. And that's what was, in a certain respect, that was even worse. Because here I'm a nice guy, I'm paying for it. You could justify what you do versus stealing. Stealing, nobody could justify. I mean, you know, it's yours, not mine. But if I pay for it, then then I could take it. And that was even a bigger corruption. which was the reason why God destroyed the earth. Okay. Um, not only that, the Pasuk says, Vatimale, again, when Torah uses a word, it means literally. 
The Pasuk says, The earth was full of robbery. Not like we say, okay, full. Full means there was no place on earth that didn't have robbery. Kuntur says it was full of robbery, meaning, the Zaira says, every single place in the world was full of robbery. Another opinion, Hamas, uh, what's the name? The Ibn Ezra writes, Hamas means they took everybody else's wives against their will. Not monetary thing, they took actually the wives without permission. Hamas right now from... Not Hamas, no. Isn't it similar though? The word? <laughs> uh, Hamas, Hamas. Yeah, they, they, listen, they're bad just the same. A lot of, no, a lot of, uh, time, hey and hey, so. Yeah, Hamitz and Matzah, but they're pretty different. <laughs> okay. Vayara Lekim Esaretz, Hashem saw the earth, and he said, as the Mephosh to the Kliyoka says, here it means idolatry. Why? Because it says God saw that the land was corrupt, which implies only God saw is corrupt. Now, if everybody's stealing, everybody steals is corrupt. The only thing that only God knows is if you believe in idols. That's what you believe inside. So only God, that's why the Pasik says, God saw the land, only God saw the land that was corrupt. That means idolatry. Because only God knows what's going on in the heart of a person. Vinay Nishchasa, it was lewd completely, it was completely destroyed. Vikihishchis kolbasar, and the Pasuk said like this, because all, of, all flesh, mean all living things, destroyed as Darke Allah path on the earth. Meaning, Rashi says, animals mated, with other animals. Um, most commentaries explain human beings sinned, because all flesh means human beings. But Rashi says, um, it means every living creature. Now the question is like this, is a, there's a very interesting question asked over here. Animals don't have free will. You know, when you choose to do evil, basically is I have the choice to do good or bad and I choose good or bad. So if I do good, I'm good. I choose to do bad, I'm bad. Animals don't have free choice. So how is it possible that even the animals sinned? They don't, they don't, they don't have free choice. How can they sin? They're not making a logical choice that I'm going to sin. But the interesting answer is Sometimes the effect of people in corruption makes the atmosphere corrupt whether you know about it or not. In other words, the evil of the people caused that the air of the atmosphere of the earth, and we're going to learn even the earth itself was corrupt. Instead of giving wheat, it gave weeds. Everybody became corrupt. Where did that come from? <clears throat> the atmosphere in the air created by people's corruption actually caused indirectly that animals sinned and, and the earth sinned and everybody sinned. It just in the air that led everybody, even without free choice, just to sin. Which shows how much impact every person has on the world. When you do something good, we cannot think it's only I'm doing good and that's it. You do good, the whole world is being elevated. You do bad, the whole world is becoming corrupt. And here we see it clearly. I mean, here was to an extreme. <clears throat> that everybody was really bad, so it caused everything neutral to be bad. And everything was bad. Allah on the earth, it everything was bad. Okay. Okay. Okay, so now God says to Neich, Kate Kolbasar Balafane, the end of all flesh, I've had enough already. Enough is enough. The world became corrupt between man to man. Hashem said, that's it. I, I'm not keeping them anymore. 
Kate Kobasa, but he doesn't say of all people. He says all flesh. Because we know animals died in the flood. The only one, by the way, that didn't, we'll learn later, are the fish. The fish always remained pure. They never mated with other fish. They didn't do whatever. The fish were the only ones that remained pure and good. So therefore, they were the only animals safe from the flood. And it was actually a miracle that they were saved. Because how did the fish survive? They weren't in the ark. There was no water in the ark, right? You had to cover it, make sure no water gets in. The fish were in the floodwaters. But later we'll learn the floodwaters was boiling hot. Boiling hot. So how did the fish survive in boiling hot water? So it was a miracle that Hashem did that the fish were saved because they weren't corrupt. So Hashem even did a miracle for the fish. And therefore fish, by the way, are very unique. In, fish is a pretty holy thing. Number one, we know fish multiply tremendously. Why? So it says, because, like Yaakov Avinu said, Vayidgu they should multiply like fish. Why do fish multiply a lot? Because they're covered with the water. There's no eye in heart, there's no evil eye. What you see, you can give an evil eye to. Fish are always covered. They're hidden in the water. If they're hidden in the water, there was never eye in heart given to the fish, so they multiply a lot. Only humans can do eye in heart. Uh, fish, upon other fish, they, cannot, they don't understand. Nah, only animals don't give iron hearts. People give iron hearts. <laughs> so what? One sec. Mermaids. <laughs> Torah doesn't talk about dinosaurs. That doesn't mean there were no dinosaurs. Torah doesn't talk about mermaids. That doesn't mean there were no mermaids. In fact, the Medrash says. Anything that exists on the dry land exists in the ocean. There's inanimate, plant, animal, human. So it says in the Madrash, everything that exists in dry land exists. So what is the human species in the water? I don't know. Maybe a mermaid. I don't know. Torah doesn't say anywhere there are no mermaids. Huh? Isn't it product of human and a fish? No. I don't think so. No. Maybe the movies show that. I don't know what the reality is. <laughs> the question is, where they? I mean, Torah doesn't say they weren't. But they weren't people. I mean, that's... <clears throat> okay, so fish... By the way, you know why it says in, 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 in Sfarim, believe it or not, does it, you know, on Shabbos you're supposed to eat fish? Simply is because fish is a delicacy. But it's brought down in Kabbalah, another reason why you're supposed to eat fish. Don't ask me what it means, but this is what it says. That the souls of certain righteous tzaddikim come back in fish. That's what it says in Kabbalah. I don't know what it means, so don't even waste your time asking me. <clears throat> certain tzaddikim come back as fish, and when you eat fish on Shabbos, it elevates the, the, the souls of those tzaddikim. What? I can't imagine them coming back and tray for fish, but I don't know. And they won't be elevated. Can't make a breath. Yeah, I know, but I'm saying that. Whatever. So, can I ask you a question? Yeah. If the animals, they don't have brain. Brains? They don't have brain. I mean, they are. They like, have a brain. They don't have wisdom. They don't. Yeah, have, they're not they free have, choice. And so. And if they don't have chachma, if they, they don't understand it, why they have to be punished? I told you, because they still did things which were wrong. Because of the atmosphere, Hashem says, these things are corrupt. I'm going to pick, and by the way, which animals came into the ark? Those animals that didn't sin. When Hashem told them to take seven and two, right? right. So... There, there were not seven horses in the I mean, the horses were trafe. There were not only two horses in the world, obviously. There were millions. Which ones went into the ark? 
So it says the ones that were behaving, the horses that behaved, that the ark took in, and otherwise the ark threw them out. This whole ark bit, by the way, we start learning it. It was an unbelievable miracle that people don't even realize the miracle of it. The size of it, how it held everything, and you know, it was an unbelievable miracle. And that's why it says in Kabbalah that Noach refused to go out of the ark until God told him to go out. Why? Because in the ark, Noach lived like the era of Mashiach when it says the wolf and the lamb will, the Garzev and Kevas, the, la, the lamb and the wolf will be peaceful together. When is that? When Mashiach comes. What was in the ark? They were all peaceful. That means inside, this is what it says in Kabbalah, inside the ark was the era of Mashiach. And therefore, Nerech said, I'm not going out. As busy as he was, he got kicked, he got bitten, whatever it was. He said, I'm not going out. This is too great. Until God said, get out. Then he had no choice. Okay. So, now what's in, it's, okay, let's first finish the Pasuk. Because they're, again, they're full of robbery, right? Even though, like we said, they did, they transgressed everything. Bottom line, only robbery. Okay. Um, now, another thing that Amban says, why did God seal the decree of the flood? on robbery. He said, because robbery is a logical commandment that even if Torah wasn't given, even if the seven night laws weren't given, people would should understand it themselves. What's yours is yours, what's mine is mine. Why should I take what's yours? Jealousy. Yeah, I understand, but I'm saying that's a logical thing that even everybody can understand without prophets, Noah, or anybody else having to tell the people. But here we see another interesting thing. When Hashem says to him, okay, I, I'm destroying my some Esa Oretz, and here's another, by the way, before we go further, in my some Esa Oretz, it doesn't say Min Oretz, I'm going to destroy them from the land. The Torah says, I'm going to destroy, in English it's translated because there's no other choice. But Rashi says, what does it mean, Esa Oretz? Together with the earth. I'm doing, going to destroy them with the earth. The flood, it says in the Medrash, and in Zohar and all over the place, three tvachim, three hand breaths. Each hand breath is between four, three to four inches. Okay? Three hand breaths of the earth was washed away in the flood. The earth became so corrupt, the earth became so corrupt that in, always in Allah you have a concept of Gimel Tvachim was like together. So it was like 9 to 12 inches of topsoil were actually destroyed in the flood. So Hashem didn't say here, if you, if you know Hebrew, He didn't say, I'm going to destroy them from the earth. I'm going to destroy Es Oretz means together with the earth. The earth was also destroyed. Which, by the way, just from a uh, scientific point of view, when they uh, mention the age of the earth, millions or billions or trillions or zillions, whatever it is, it keeps changing from one million, they as if, but it's five million, six million, you know, as if a million years is nothing. I mean, you know, the whole world's 5,769 years old. I mean, it's like... But... How do, they, how do they prove the age of the world? Basically, it's carb, different forms of carbon dating. They say that if from here to here, such a change happened, so from here to here, another change happened. Okay? So they say if from here to here took a thousand years, so from here to here took a million years. That's how they basically carbon dated. But carbon dating and all those types of scientific proofs only work if things 
run normally. I'll give you an example. A volcano, earthquake, yeah? Or the flood as we're learning here. An earthquake could change the earth system in f- what was the earth north bigger uh, six, the, seconds. Huh? six mm-hmm. seconds six seconds change the earth with the earthquake what normally could have taken maybe a half a million years and it happened in six seconds a volcano when a mountain explodes in in five minutes that could take something that normally would take a million years to do the topsoil that the 40-day flood 40 day flood washed off could have normally been taking millions of years but it happened in 40 days so all these psukim by the way the same thing when God created a dinosaur how do they another way they do it we learned they find dinosaur bones and again Torah doesn't say there are no dinosaurs yeah they find dinosaur bones and based on carbon dating the dinosaur bone would be a million years old yeah, but what they don't understand is on day one when God made the dinosaur, God created a full-grown dinosaur. So the bones could have looked like a million years, but they were one day old. God created them full-grown. All these things, the flood, the way God created the world, all these things challenge completely the theory. By the way, it's only a theory anyway, which means it's not true. A theory of the age of the world. But over here by the flood, Hashem said, I'm going to destroy them. Now, later on in Chumash, Hashem came to Avram Avinu and said, I'm going to destroy the city of Zdom. Zdom and Amor, right? I'm going to destroy them. They're corrupt. I'm going to destroy them. What was the first thing Avram Avinu did? He said to God, no. Maybe there's righteous people, maybe this, maybe there's 50, maybe there's 40, maybe there's 30. He started arguing with God not to destroy the world. We don't find in the Chumash that Noyach said to God, no, you can't do it, don't do it. He didn't, and nowhere does it say Noyach fought for his generation, like Avram Avinu did. Therefore, all Noyach was interested in you're blocking you're blocking what 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 Nayak did he took care of himself he took care of himself in the Hasidic expression Nayak is called a tzaddik in pelts a tzaddik in pelts Pelts is, you know, those big, heavy, pardon the expression, fur coats that the Russians would have, or the people in Alaska have, the big fur coats that keep in all the heat. Okay? Nech was called a tzaddik in pelts, meaning he took care of himself, he kept himself warm, he kept himself holy, but he didn't care about anybody else. And that was Nech's crime. That's one of the reasons why the floodwaters are called Nech's flood, May Nech. Because Neir didn't fight for his generation. He only cared about himself and his family. That's all he cared about. And therefore we find an interesting thing. In Piki Ovis, in the fifth chapter, it says there are ten generations from Adam to Noach. And then God destroyed the world. Then it said there are ten generations from Noach to Avram. And then it said they were corrupt. And then it says, Avram Avinu came and got the reward of all the ten generations. By Nayach, it doesn't say he got the reward of the generation. It says in Pekir Avis, Nayach, the people were destroyed and Nayach was saved. But it doesn't say he got the reward for the people. So some commentaries say there was no reward to get. But some commentaries explain because Nayach didn't care about anybody else but himself. So why should he get the reward of the good other people did? Avram Avinu, Avram cared about everybody else. He went out of his way to fight for the other people that God shouldn't destroy them. He went out to spread godliness in the world. Nayach didn't do that. Nayach was a tzaddik in his warm coat. 
he sat in his house while he's building the, the ark, the teva. If somebody asked him what's going on, he said, uh, God's going to destroy the world. He didn't go out there to preach. He didn't go out there to bring people closer to God. He didn't care about other people, only himself. So yeah, he was a righteous man, but nowhere near the greatness of Abraham, of Rav Avram. The, the moral of the story, by the way, is that people cannot be selfish to only care about themselves. Physically, spiritually, you can't say, okay, I took care of myself, and as expression in Hebrew, I saved my own soul and I don't care about anybody else. That is what Noach did. And therefore the flood waters are called on Noach's name. You have to be like Avram, you have to go out and you have to influence people. That's the role of every person, to influence other people. Okay, so now it's says like this. I say lecha, make, and some people, like the Radak says, it doesn't mean you must make uh, an ark. If you want to, you can make an ark. <clears throat> Hashem said, you want to protect yourself, you can make an ark. You don't want to, don't. Um... Okay, according to the Abarbanel, and we'll see more about that in a minute, what does it mean when God said make lucha? Okay, the question over here is in grammar, the Torah should have said, in Hebrew, make an ark. Why does the Torah say make for yourself an ark? So one answer is, Hashem said, listen, if you want to protect yourself, you could do it. <clears throat> the Barbanel says, no. <clears throat> you have to do it yourself. Nobody can help you. Nobody can help you with it. You got to do it yourself. The al says, meaning, make an ark like you are. <laughs> meaning, you're aloof of everybody else. Isolate yourself in the ark and seclude yourself from everybody else. Just separate yourself. Okay? Now, if the purpose was to save Noyach, there are many ways God could have done it. You know, God could have destroyed the entire world like Korah, right? The earth opened up, everybody got swallowed in, and uh, everybody else was saved. God could have destroyed the world in a million different ways without having Noyach to build an ark that took him 120 years to build. And it's an interesting thing. So it could be that 120 years old could be also one day by the Hashem, No. No. When it says day in Torah, what does it mean? Day. What's a day? 24 hours. When it says a year, it means 354, 365 days. When it says 120 years, it doesn't mean 120 times to 100,000 or whatever. Noach had to build the Tev himself. Okay, so there's a lot of different answers over here. One answer is, why did Hashem... Hashem could have saved Noach differently. Just kill everybody. Everybody, yeah. <laughs> Today's 40th anniversary of Jim Jones. Remember Jonestown? Okay. They all drank their Kool-Aid. A thousand people died. Remember those of you that are older than 40? I mean, you have to be a lot older than 40 to remember this. They just showed the... Uh, I didn't. I just heard on the radio today that it's 40 years since Jim Jones. Okay. He gave him the Kool-Aid, and they all dropped dead. Yeah? Hashem could have given everybody Kool-Aid. The whole world could have died, and they would uh, be Kool-Aid free. I mean, there's so many ways of Hashem doing it. So one answer is, Hashem still, still gives the people an opportunity to, to repent. They're going to see Nayak chopping down trees. <coughs> They're going to see Nayak painting stuff. They're going to see, you know, they're going to ask him, what's going on? What are you doing? So then Nehach going to tell him, if you don't behave, God's going to destroy the world. And he still didn't care, right? But Hashem wanted to give them one last chance, even after he sealed the decree. 
And there's another remarkable how kind Hashem is. He sealed the decree that he's going to destroy the world. And he still gave him another 120 years to repent and do tshuva. They still didn't. Because Nech wasn't out there, you know, influencing them. He was busy. <laughs> he was busy. <clears throat> Somebody's like Noah comes out and wants to help people, they're not gonna listen. If somebody doesn't want to go that way, they're not a real Chabadnik. When you go out to the world to people, they are want, they want and are willing to listen. People want to listen. People want something substantial that they don't have. Without Torah, there's no meaning of life. There's no in-depth meaning of life. People are looking for the meaning of life. That's what everybody wants. Okay? If you go out to them and you present it in the proper way, people are dying to, to receive it. And Noach didn't bother doing that. Avram Avinu did. And therefore Avram Avinu converted, so to speak, thousands and thousands and thousands of people, him and his wife, and Neach didn't. But there's another interesting thing over here with the ne- with the table when he says, say lecha. Hashem said that, like the Barbanel said, Neach had to build it completely himself. Okay? That means he had to chop all the wor- wor- wood himself. No helpers. No caring help. No. No. Hashem said, you got to make it. That was part of Noach's tshuva, by the way. Because he didn't do anything, God said, okay, you're going to work on this table. Do you know what it is? The, the ark was 300 amets, 450 feet long. Yeah? Uh, 30 is 45 feet high and 50, 75 feet wide. For any of you that know, a football field is 300 feet. This is one and a half times a football field. You know football field? Well, the young guys would know. The football field is 100 yards, which is 300 feet. Now, no, do you know what it is? Try to picture you're building a big house with a plank of wood, let's say 100 feet long. You have to carry it yourself. You have to nail it yourself. And nobody can even help you. That itself would take 120. <laughs> that itself would take 120 years to do. That's how the it's interesting. There's a sicha from the Rebbe. The Rebbe asked the question and pshat. Rashi doesn't say why it took so long to build the tefer. It took him 120 years. So how in pshat, how a kid asks a question to Rashi, how is it possible it took so long? So the Rebbe said, no, because the kid understands what he's learning. The Pazik says, you got to make it yourself. If you got to make it yourself, chopping the wood, schlepping the wood, nailing the wood, sealing the wood. 120 years. Well, if, if it would be today, it would not, wouldn't be even a question. You know what it is to get permits? <laughs> if Nur if would have to get permits from Beverly Hills, it would take him 500 years to build it. So, uh, thank God there are no permits in those days. Okay, so he says like this. Make the, <clears throat> make, uh, the, the, the ark yourself. Okay? Um, okay, Noah didn't care. I mean, the nurse people didn't even bother answering this. Okay, then he says like this. Asay lechot teva atse goifer. Okay? Now, teva literally means a box. In Hebrew, teva means a box. Here it means an ark. An ark is really a big box. That's what it is. By the way, we'll learn, it wasn't even built like a ship. A ship, you know, goes narrow at the bottom. The teva was actually square. I mean, rectangular, but it was not... There was no bottom that like goes into the water. The, 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 there were no oars. Nobody was rowing the, the teva. 
The Teva, the Medru says, was a complete mercy of the rain, of the flood. It was just a box floating around in the water. No, and he made it that it should be able to float. But there was no movement, nobody ran it, there were no motors, there were no oars guiding it, nothing. It was open on top? No, 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 then they would have all, it was close on top. But I'm saying, but there was no, no oars, you know, to row it, to, to move it. It was completely at the mercy of the flood. Whatever, wherever the waters <clears throat> moved it, <clears throat> according to the Medrash, by the way, the flood never hit Israel. The whole world was hit by the flood, but Israel was saved. Now, mathematically, it's a little difficult, you know, scientifically, but the Medri says Israel was not touched by the flood. Now, the word teva, so it was what's that, what's that? The, word, what's that? the word teva, besides meaning ark or box, the Baal Shem Tev explained the word teva means words. In Hebrew, teva is a word. The Baal Shem Tev said that what is the concept of boy ala teva, come into the ark? The Baal Shem Tev said like this. There are flood waters out there. Flood waters not in a literal sense, figuratively. There are people that want to drown us out. Making a living drowns us out. There's so many things that want to drown us. And the Baal Shem Tev said, you want to be protected from the flood waters of the world, go into the words of Torah, the words of prayer, Torah and tefillah, that protects a person from the stormy waters of the world. And in a spiritual sense, that's what God is telling Noach, and every Jew, because everything in Torah is a lesson for all of us. That we didn't learn that passage yet, but later on he says, the Baal Shem Tev said it means come into the, you want to protect yourself from the flood waters of the world? From the enemies, from the problems, from the storms that want to destroy us? Come into the words of Torah and Tefillah and you'll be protected. Yes, ma'am. You forgot, that's good. Okay, um... So he says like this, how do you make the ark? He told him, make the ark with gopher wood. What's gopher wood? Some people say, um, the Targum, let's say, translated is basically a cedar wood, cedar tree. <laughs> um, other people translated, it means pine wood. Some people say it just means ati gopher wood that floats. Wood that floats. But you have to remember, you know, just think all the animals in the world, yeah? You had elf, elephants, lions, tigers, hippopotamus, kangaroos. Um, you got massive animals in there, and it had to hold the weight. Huh? So maybe that's why they didn't take the dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> where, where was Rabbi Shustamara? Uh, where's I got the flood? I wasn't there. No. As it was close to Egypt, close to Israel, close to where? Close to Israel. <coughs> but the flood didn't... We'll learn later that the flood wasn't the destruction, the purification. The 40-day flood, we'll get a little more details, but the 40-day flood was a mikvah. A mikvah has to be the measurement of water in a mikvah is 40 saw. Whatever, saw... So, 40 saw, this is the measurement of, the, of a mikveh. The world was so corrupt, Hashem had to purify the world. Now, you can't put, the, how are you going to put the world into a mikveh? So Hashem says, this is what the Medrash says, Kabbalah says, the Zayar says, everybody says, God brought the rain for 40 days, that was actually a mikveh, God took the whole world, and put the world in, into the mikvah. The mikvah, the water was all around it. The mikvah purified the world from all the evil and corruption that the that the world had. So it was actually a purification, which answers again the question: If God wanted to destroy the world, there are many ways of doing it. 
He could just make everybody die. Finished. God didn't want to kill people. God needed to purify the world. So the only people that were not corrupt was Noach and his children, Noach and his wife and, and the children. <clears throat> All the animals, twos and the sevens, you know, those animals, and everything else died, but the earth itself, the world, was actually purified through the mikvah. That's what the mikvah actually was. Robert, what? Is it, would you think that it's like an ongoing purification that still exists till today? Are there effects that are from then, or was it just like a certain amount of time? Some people are very holy. Okay. But some of us that are not holy, do you know the flood waters that are out there today? It doesn't have to mean literal flood waters. Mm-hmm. The Patsik Shlema Melech says, Mayim Rabim lo yuchu lechabes esoava, unahodes lo yishtefua. Mayim Rabim means the great flood waters of the world that want to drown us. <coughs> Whether it's drown us into culture, society, evil, lack of Judaism, lack of godliness, lack of anything. There's a lot, there's a constant flood water out there that wants to destroy us. And therefore the Baal Shem Tev says, every day you have to go into words of Torah and Tefillah to protect yourself from this flood. Okay, so the flood is an ongoing process. It's not just, you know, it is what it is and that's it. So the fact that the flood ended physically doesn't mean that it necessarily ended spiritually or... Well, I mean, is Torah relevant today? Is Torah relevant today? Of course. Okay. Is the flood relevant today? Yes. Okay. What's the relevance of the flood today? Huh? And making the teva. That we have to make our own boundaries, so to speak. To protect them. ourselves from the flood. What are with words of Torah and Tefillah? Like the Baal Shem Tev said. Okay, let me tell you something. A person is a microcosm. A person is a mini world. At, at the Pasuk says, Esa olam nasam And the Medri says, the world is an Adam Godal and the person, I mean, I'm sorry, a Adam is Elam Katan. The wor- a person is a small world. Okay? And the world is a big person. Yes? My father once told me a story. I mean, it wasn't uh, a true story or not, whatever. A father was in a meeting. And his little brat kid was disturbing the meeting. Okay? And the father wanted to get rid of the kid. For a while. Not permanently, for a while. So there was a picture of a globe. I, I mean, a picture and a piece of paper of the world. The father ripped it up into pieces and, to- and then mixed them up and told the kid when you put the world back together then you can come bother me again. Okay? The father thought it was going to take him hours and hours and hours. Half an hour later the kid was back. <clears throat> With the perfect map of the world. So the father says to the kid how did you do it? How did you do it so fast? The kid turned over the paper. On the other side of the paper was the form of a human body. So the kid didn't need to know geography. He took the other side and the human body knows where the head and the hand and the... So he was able to do it very quickly. Okay, it's, that's the... It's a muscle for something. The, the analogy is the world, a person is a mini world. You, a person is put together, the whole world is put together. Understand? Each one of us, okay, have to take this 
personal and literal for our own lives, correct? Each one of us, you, 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 me, everybody, have floods. We have our own issues, difficulties. They're basically called the want to drown us out, correct? Want to destroy us in one way or another. Each one of us has to be protected from the flood, <coughs> correct? From our own personal flood. How do we do that? <clears throat> so the Torah says what Nerech was told to do. Make the ark, meaning make the words. Go into the words of Torah. Go into the words of Tefillah. That will protect you from the storm waters of the world. You'll be anchored in properly that nothing will happen to you. Is that the flood today? 100%. You have your flood. I have my flood. She has her flood. He has her fl- his flood. And everybody has to be protected from the flood. Why is that so difficult? Because I'm thinking about Noah was a different kind of person though than a lot of people. Even though he wasn't, let's say, going out to change other people, but he was righteous in his own way. So he had an advantage in a certain in a certain sense. What was his advantage? That he didn't do what he was supposed to do. <coughs> She's not really an advantage. She's a disadvantage. Okay. Kinim Tasa Sateva. You should make the ark with compartments. You know, you have so many different species. You know, they're animals. So you have to make uh, compartments. The chafar to Esau, and you should cover it, mi bayis umichot inside and outside, bakefu with pitch. Pitch means the tar, because it had to withstand the powerful waters. Is again, even though it's miraculous, because the water was boiling hot. Nevertheless, Noach had to do in a natural way what God wants him to do, to protect himself in a natural way. Build the teva and so on and so forth. Okay, now what did Radak explains? In case the outer pitch becomes rubbed out, so at least you have the inner pitch. When Moshe Rabbeinu's mother, Rashi says, when Moshe Rabbeinu's mother put him into the basket, you know, into the Nile, over there she only put it on the outside for two reasons. Number one, she didn't want her baby smelling tar from the inside, which is awful smell. And secondly, over there the waters weren't raging like the flood, where you need very strong uh, protection. Over there was just in the Nile or whatever it was. Okay. So this is the way you should make it. Hashem gave him, and it's interesting because obviously if the Teva, okay, God could have told them, make a Teva. Okay? And he would have figured out how to make a Teva. Don't forget, he invented the plow. Noach we learned before invented the plow. He was a very smart guy. Okay? He was probably at an architectural degree or contracted degree. Okay? Yet every detail of the ark, Hashem told him to make. And there's a reason why all these measurements are what they are. 300 long, and, you know, there's a reason for it. Vizash Tasa, he said, this is the way you should make it. Shlesh meyes ama, 300 cubits, okay? Um, which is, again, one ama, an ama fluctuates, I mean, different opinions, it's anywhere between 18 inches, meaning a foot and a half to two feet. It ranges in halacha between a foot and a... Officially, an amma is by an average person from here to here. That is... How much is it in inches? So there are opinions ranging from 18 to 2. 18 inches to 2 feet. So let's just make the math easier. We'll count it 2 feet. So he made it 300 amas long, meaning 600 feet long. Okay? Which is a double football field, by the way. Football field, we said before, is 100, I mean, 300 feet, 100 yards. This is double that. 
Um, 50 cubits its width, and 30 amas the height. So basically it was like this. 600 feet long, 100 feet wide, 60 feet high. Because he had three stories. In the, the ark had three stories. So that was 60, right? So each height was 10 amma, like 20 feet each floor. And then, so that was the, the basic size of how big the table was. Now just to finish with this. You know in the story of the Megillah of Esther, when Haman said to hang Mordechai on the gallow 50 cubits high, they said, let's take a... It says in the book of Esther, right? So the Medrash says, where did he get that 50 cubit pole from? 7,500 feet high, it's tall. So it said, one of Neach's many sons was in charge of Mount Ararat, which was the place that Teva landed after the flood. And he pulled off a 50 ama pole from the ark and brought it to Haman. That's where he got it from. It was pretty mess. Okay. To be continued.